I'm always happy when, you know, somebody who's 80 years old buys one of my paintings. But what I really like is when I see somebody who's in their mid thirties that are buying one. As an, uh, most artists, they tend to sell their work to people who are right around their same age. And when you get a broad age spectrum, that gives you longevity in your career. It usually means you're ahead of your time. And, and I think that that's a really important thing for, for an artist to, to experiment and try new and different things. And, and you know, I think that the best years of my career are still yet to come. So you're a uh, Zoom newbie, eh? Uh, yeah, I've done it one time before. And oh, so, you have yeah, done one time before. Okay. One, one time, but it's, I feel like it's my first time. It feels like your first time. That's how it always feels on Zoom, baby. Yeah, yeah. It's always yeah, much. Much. It's always, it's always much. Much. on Zoom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I would think you're a veteran at this by now. Uh, I am getting pretty good at it, actually, yeah. surprisingly. Yeah. Uh, I was a little hesitant about three months ago, uh, you know, because I have my studio. And, yeah. uh and I like that interaction where we're sitting next to each other and can look each other in the eye. And then we did Zoom. It's like, well, this is exactly the same, except right. I, my studio can be a mess, and uh, I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to do anything about social distancing. And I think I'll just do it like this from now on. I'm not sure I'll ever go back to in studio just because, you know, like trying to get you on would be a hassle yes. to get you to, you know, either I go up there and meet with you in Santa Fe or you have right. to come here. And right, right. I, we don't have to do that. We can yeah. do this. I, I do want to get to Tucson. Uh, I, I love Tucson and, and I definitely want to get down there, but just in the winter months. Yeah. So. Or today because it's freaking <laughs> cold in Santa Fe right now, right? Oh, it's, it's snowing like crazy right now. Oh, that's fantastic. How much yeah. snow are you guys supposed to get? Uh, well, yeah, they say, uh, they say uh, three to six inches um, and then above 7,500 feet up to a foot. Wow. So, uh, so we'll see. It definitely feels like last week felt like a warm fall. This week feels like full winter. Yeah. Did it just go literally like green trees, tomatoes on the plants to six yep. inches of snow? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's New Mexico. <laughs> I, I, I don't miss that part of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Well, how, how, how is it down there? Is it, is it That's, nice? uh, Well, today is it's freezing, right? It's like 65 degrees. Oh, yeah. So I had to wear pants. This is the first time I had to yeah. actually wear pants <laughs> since maybe March or April. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. An odd feeling. <laughs> yeah. I had to find them. And here's the funny part. I put them on and they're like, uh, these were not as tight the last time I put these on. Uh, that's the COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's pandemic yeah. blubber. <laughs> it's the pandemic pounds. I still got them on, but, you know, it's a, actually I could loosen them a little and they're not so tight. I just don't want to put a pull a Tobin there. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. A so you're in Galisteo, right? You're not actually in Santa Fe, right? You know, I, I used to live in Galisteo. Oh, okay. But, um, uh, my life changed uh, four years ago, and um, and then I moved into uh, into town. I moved what, into downtown Santa Fe. What happened four years ago? If you if you want to share. Oh, uh, well, I, I I went through a divorce. Um, hmm. I had been married, and and um, it, I lived in Galisteo for 16 years, and uh, my ex and I we had a. Uh, we had a small ranch property with uh, the view of, um, you know, the Galisteo Basin. And, and, um, and that was always a very inspirational place artistically for me. And then after that, it was, it, it was a little too ice waiting for me. So, so I decided I would move into town. And then recently, um, I have a new person in my life. And we, we purchased a house just north of Santa Fe mm. in, uh, in, in, in an area called Las Campanas. And yeah, so, I lived out there for a while. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. And it's beautiful. I mean, the view is gorgeous. And, and, and it's, it's great. And so I have a, and since it's snowing today, I have a studio here in, in, in the home. And, uh, and then I still have my studio downtown. So I can, I can, um, I can have the best of both worlds. So do you like it better than Galisteo? I mean, Galisteo to me is like one of the greatest places on earth. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just, there's so many beautiful places in, in Santa Fe. 
And, uh, I mean, Galisteo definitely had that more rural feel. I mean, it has that, it has a sense of authenticity, um, to it that that's why they film movies there. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, there's no, there's no phone wires. There's no, there's no nothing. It's, it's probably as close to, it was, you know, a hundred years ago. And, uh, and the village is, is quaint and it's still, you know, it's been left, um, really intact, you know, and the, the cottonwood trees, and the old adobes. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a very special place. It really is. So, so, yeah, were there's you, a lot of great places in New Mexico like that. Were you close to Billy Shanks, you know, or Billy's places? Um, like? You know, no, he, he's in, uh, he's in uh, La Senegal. Yeah, he is. Yeah, that's right. Los yeah. Los. Yeah. So I was like, I don't know if you know who uh, Woody Gwynn is. Yeah, you know, I know you very know. well. Yeah, and so I was, uh, you know, kind of, I was behind the old cemetery. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and so, but I, you know, interacted with Woody a few times, and, and there were some other painters out there. He was kind of my favorite one. I mean, he I used like, to represent him. Oh, you did? Really? Yeah. Oh, cool. I just, yeah. you know, I was too young and too early in my career, and I couldn't yeah. find an audience for his work, but I'm a huge yeah. fan, and he's, you know, he's a really gifted guy. Yeah, he is. He is. He's fantastic, and his... And the place they live in is so cool. It's the old cavalry barracks. I don't know if you ever went in there, but man, it's cool. And um, and I'm always amazed at the size that he paints because I paint huge paintings. I'm I'm working at painting larger paintings, but he'll do these massive egg tempera paintings. And I mean, it would take me a year and a half to do one of those. It's yeah, just, I know they're monsters. Well, he doesn't crazy. produce a lot. <laughs> I mean, he is slow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's a, it's a, that's a slow medium for sure, yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, I mean, Billy Shank lives in a beautiful area too. That oh, whole, yeah. that whole area down there is just, it's just stunning. Well, all three of you have something in common. You live in wonderful places and have done well enough to have nice homes and live in places. You know, people always yeah. think that artists are starving, and we're going to get in that with you because I'm sure there was yeah. points in time where you didn't think you could make it as an artist, but you know, you can if you really put your mind to it and you work hard and you're, I think it helps. I do think it helps to be in Santa Fe to some extent, if you're an artist, just to make, it's like being in LA, if you're going to be in the TV business, right? I do think there is something to be said about being in that environment. Uh, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I moved here uh, about 20 years ago from Minneapolis and, um, and I had worked in design and advertising and I painted part-time and, and, uh, started coming to Santa Fe in the, in the early nineties and, and looked around and realized for the first time, you know what? And I had always wanted to be a painter, but, and I had trained as a wildlife artist and that kind of thing. But I all of a sudden realized, you know, you can actually make a living at this here. And so, so that was kind of the hook of, and plus I just, I, I love Santa Fe the second I stepped foot in it. And, um, and so there, there is that sense, like people come here from all the world by art. And it's an amazing thing. And I think it's a very unusual thing. And so you yeah, have to be here is very helpful, I think. Yeah, yeah, I always used to laugh when somebody would come from Tucson to my Santa Fe gallery, never been in my Tucson gallery, and they come and buy something in Santa Fe. And I'd be like, I'm right there. <laughs> I'm down the street. And they're like, right. yeah, I want to come to Santa Fe. And, you know, yep. Yep. Like, okay, I'll sell it to you here. We'll bring it back home to Tucson. It's so true. It's so true. I mean, there's a lot of people coming from Texas, which is fantastic. But, you know, if you show in Texas, I don't know if they would buy your work there because part of it is the experience of coming here, you know? Yeah. I think it is a problem. And, and Santa yeah. Fe really needs the Texans. Um, they, desperately, do. they desperately need the Texans. And yep. they didn't yep. get them this year. Not a lot of them. No, it's uh, – I think um, especially, you know, I, I'll say, you know, for the gallery that represents me in Santa Fe, um, they, they have – they have uh, excellent salespeople and they have a really good online game and they, they're, they're not doing badly. I think they're, they're doing pretty well. Um, but I, there's a lot of other businesses that are really struggling in Santa Fe because of, of just the way the whole uh, shutdown has been handled. And, and it's just kind of, you know, uh, people are being told not to come here and, um, yeah, right. and that's, that's a tough deal, you know? Well, especially if you depend strictly on tourist walking trade, which a lot of the kind of the plaza and the tourist trade yep. stuff, you know, yep. they don't have internet and they don't may not even have great art. They may just have things that they need to sell. And if you don't get people, I don't, I don't know how they stay in business, but. Yeah. Well, some of them aren't going to, I mean, no. it's, 
there's, there's, I mean, there's more vacancies now than I've probably ever seen. And there's not, that's not overwhelming. There's not, I don't sense this feeling of desperation or anything, but um, up until now, the restaurants have been able to do a lot of outdoor dining and really have capitalized on that. But that's going to change now. I mean, just this week, I mean, no one's going to want to sit outside. It's, it's cold. Right. And nobody may want to sit inside because of COVID because it's you know, yeah. going yeah. very, it's, you know, even in New Mexico, it's skyrocketing. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it's a tough deal. Yeah. It's a really tough deal. So, so far, this has been a very depressing podcast. <laughs> so, 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 but what, what you said, uh, what you said before is, is about, you know, succeeding as an artist. I think, you know, one of the biggest things is, is persistence, you know, just sticking with it. And, um, and you'll have, I mean, there have been times where I'm like, you know, it, it's, it's a tough business. And, um, and now I can reflect back and people are like, wow, you're, you're always busy. And, uh, or you, you, you know, you seem like things are going really well. I'm like, well, I've been doing it for 20 years and, and it makes a big difference. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't feel like 20 years, but it's been, it's been, it's been 20 years and, um, and to stick with it. And also to really work at developing your own unique, recognizable style of, of, of seeing the world and um, to be able to separate yourself from everybody else so people can recognize your work without reading your signature. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing. We're going to go down that road too, because I want to talk about that, but let's start at the beginning because I'd like to know a little bit more about you. It's, you know, cause the way we met actually, I, I don't know, have we ever actually met in person? Do you know? Uh, we met, uh, actually I met you, uh, Jane Hamilton did a pop-up across the street from Manitou. Yep. And I met you there. Okay. I couldn't remember. I yeah. thought we probably met somewhere along the way, but, uh, you know, you had contact. I w I've always been a fan of your work and always knew about your work Thank and always followed your work uh, because just like you said, it is extremely unusual and it's got a, a sense of its own. You, when you see one of your paintings, you know that, okay, that is a William Haskell painting. There's no doubt about it. No one else can do that. Um, I don't think anybody can actually can do that, but you, and so that's a, you know, that's like a huge important thing as far as I'm concerned as an artist and you contacted me and you know, you were like, are you interested? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> you Thank you. I'm interested. <laughs> I was glad to say, I was glad you said hell yeah, because I was, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always admired your gallery and, and I've been to, I, I was, I had gone to the one in Santa Fe and I've been to the one in Tucson. And, uh, and I love Maynard Dixon's work and I know you're a huge collector of his and a, and a big fan and, and just the other artists you carry uh, are, it's, the, you, you become what you surround yourself by and, and that's, the, that's part of the goal, you know, yeah. and, and that's a big deal. And so you've got a great gallery. Thank you. Yeah, we're real careful about new artists, you know, we want to, they have to be someone that has their own lane, has their own vision, um, has as a person I can work with too, because, and vice versa. So I turned down almost everybody. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but when the ones I want, I really want. And uh, I, I usually don't go after them so much. They usually contact me and, um, or I might just say some, something uh, like, you know, I'd love to show you sometime. There's a few out there that I've missed that I would like to, to have in the, in the, you know, really showing them on a regular basis, like Russell Case, I think is a phenomenal artist that yep. I don't show, really except on occasional group shows. And he's a guy that we've just kind of always missed. I don't know how, don't know why, but he, he definitely has that sensibility. You're another one of those artists and you called me, which was great. And uh, that means I'm going to get you when you get, when you call me versus maybe sometimes if I call you, it won't work out the same way, but. Right. I know. I know. it. Yeah. You know, I kind of look at it and I was looking at it the same way. I'm like, well, you know, you, you, as an artist, you think, okay, unless a gallery contacts you, are they really interested in your work? And, but finally, I, you know, I've been showing and participating in the art world down in Tucson for a while. And, and as far as I'm concerned, your gallery is, is a top gallery there. Thanks. And it has, and you also embrace the modernist. Oh, I do. Painting, you I know, love rather it. than, rather than a very traditional style of painting, yeah. which, which is, which is my, that's where I fall into. And so, um, so I was so pleased that you said yes, because it was, it's a big compliment to my work and, and, uh, and you're doing, you're doing phenomenally well with it. I, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. You fit right into that niche 
of contemporary Western modern art, which I love. And it's not, it's not easy to find somebody that really fills that area. There's not that many that really do it and do it right. I mean, you have people like Ed Mel is one and Stephen Datz, I think, is one. And, you know, there's yep. people that really, you know, can do that, but most do not. And, um, and they're all looking for it, I think. They're all trying to figure out how to do it, but uh, yep. it's hard to do. And some have done better at it than others. I think John Moyers has done, and Terry has done a really nice job of kind of tweaking what they do uh, into a more modern sensibility that really works beautifully. And it yeah. seems like they kind of did it effortlessly, which I love. Uh, that's again, great artists can do that. Yeah. Anything done well looks easy. But yeah. that's, <laughs> that's true. But we know it isn't easy. So let's start, from the, let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Wisconsin. And so uh, born in Wisconsin, lived there briefly. We lived in the deep south for a while, then moved to, uh, to Ohio, lived in Alabama, Louisiana. How long did you live in Alabama, Louisiana? Where, what, okay. age, what ages were you when you were living in Louisiana? Uh, Alabama? It was in the 60s. So I was, um, you know, from 63 to when I was born to uh, 1970, 71, we moved to, so I was a little kid. And, uh, but I was, I started to draw when I was about four. And I remember my first painting class in, in Baton Rouge, which is where we lived in, in Louisiana. And I still have my first painting I did, and it was of a whale. Uh, it's not very good. Um, and, uh, but, uh, so I started to paint that and just drew a lot. And um, my parents were, uh, we, we then moved to Ohio in about 1971. And we lived in a small historic village called Granville. And it, um, my parents were, uh, my dad had a, had a full-time a professional career, but they were what also, he, well, uh, he, he was, he has a, um, or he had a PhD in, in wood science. So he developed the binding resin for particle board. And, um, and he was, um, he ended up working for the board and chemical company and uh, in as a sales manager. And he worked with paper companies and that kind of thing to, to, you know, help them develop new and innovative products so it was a big deal in his field though right it sounds like yeah yeah no he was um and 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 i think after 18 years he he uh he just didn't want to do it anymore and and we ended up moving to uh to northern wisconsin and he always loved wisconsin and we we moved and lived on the lac de flambeau indian reservation in northern wisconsin and um i went to boarding school for a year at that time and I did an apprenticeship with a guy named Terrell Kanak, who was a wildlife um, wild wild artist and a uh, really very accurate painter, stunning paintings. And he would do, at that time, he would do four or five paintings a year. And they were just these meticulous renditions of, of a lot of waterfowl and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and um, it was amazing. We'd spend days just like with, uh, he'd have drawers full of like uh, feathers and wings and beak you know, heads and feet. And, and um, it was a little too tedious for me, you know, to, to go into that level of detail. And I can be pretty detailed, but it did help, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it helped me, um, you know, kind of define my path. I loved wildlife, I love wildlife art. And I pursued that for a while. And then I just became much more um, uh, interested in the landscape and the, the natural, um, the natural abstraction I see occurring in, in, the, in the landscape, you know, with the, especially, you know, you come out to New Mexico and, and the light is so different here than anywhere, anywhere else. And you see the, uh, the way the shadows, fall, you know, kind of fall across the, the land and, and it just creates this natural abstraction. And um, I just find that fascinating. I just, when I, I can drive down the road and say, Oh my God, that's a great painting right, right there, you know, and, and um, that's it's cool. Old. How old were you when you were apprenticing with him? Uh, I was 16. Yeah, so you're still in high school, right? I was still in high school, yeah. So yeah. you must at that point realize that art was, you know, a career path that you might want to partake in. If you're a, six, if you're a 16-year-old and not chasing girls or doing things like that, but you're spending time with a guy who's looking at bird beaks and feet and meticulously drawing and painting, there was something that was clearly resonating, right? Absolutely. Um, no, I, I knew when I was, a, I mean, I, I was probably 10 when I knew I wanted to be an artist. And how did you know that? You know, I, I just, it was just in my head. 
I just knew I was always drawing and, um, and, you know, I would draw, I would do a, spend a lot of time, um, uh, copying, um, because I love wildlife, uh, these books by James Audubon, you know, uh, my parents were antique dealers every once in a while, they would, they would have an Audubon in their shop. And, and, uh, I loved his, uh, his illustrations of birds and that kind of thing. And, uh, there, now I look back on them and they're, they're, they strike me as being very scientific, you know, they're mm. a little less, they're a little less artistic and more of, more of a kind of a science project. Uh, but at that time it was very inspirational. And so, um, and it really helped me, you know, I would just sit and, and copy things out of the Audubon book and, and, uh, and that's how I really drew my wildlife. And then I would go, you know, we, we lived in a small town and it was, uh, you know, five blocks to, uh, to kind of the middle of nowhere. So I could go out and, and draw and paint, um, was there an art teacher or a uh, somebody that really inspired you or said, oh, you're really great or you won a contest or something when you were in like uh, high school or middle school? So, um, yes, there is. Uh, there was a woman at the boarding school I went to. I went to boarding school for a year uh, and her name is Bev Dolman. And uh, she, you know, immediately saw my work and she introduced me to really doing dry brush watercolor. And because she knew I liked, she saw how I drew and that I used a lot of watercolor paint. And she really, um, she really pushed me. She made the introduction between Terrell Kanak and myself. And she really, um, she really had a strong interest in, in seeing me pursuing art, uh, both professionally and just intellectually, and really helped me develop my, you know, my watercolor paintings, which I painted for, for years in watercolor. And so that was probably the most inspirational person. Yeah, I find it interesting. I see this thread over and over again. You know, an artist has the interest. They may have the ability, but it's someone else, and usually it's an art teacher, that yep. sees it and, you know, really focuses that individual at a young age that this is a career path for you. I mean, you know her name. You remember her name. And I bet you don't remember a lot of your other teachers from, you know, sophomore and high school, which I figure that's about when that was, um, that – have that big of an impact and which tells me how important school uh, art teachers are to developing artists. That's how I see it. Uh, without question. I, I, yeah. And you're absolutely right. I don't think I remember one other teacher at that, at that school other than Bev Dolma. And she just really took the time and really wanted to nurture my, what I was doing. Yeah. And we stayed in touch for a, for a couple of years after that, but um, you know, since that time, I, I don't really know what she's doing, but uh, I will, I will definitely give her a lot of credit where, where that is due. And, um, and my mother, you know, she, she introduced me a little bit. I mean, they were, they were more into kind of folk art, but she did introduce me to like George O'Keefe's work when I was very young. Cause I, I like bones, you know, I like to, uh, you know, draw skulls and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and because, uh, and also George O'Keefe was from some prairie, Wisconsin, and my parents, my mother was born and raised in Wisconsin, so she feels anything from Wisconsin is fantastic. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I was introduced introduced to her her work, and and you know I look back at that and and think, well, at at some point that I'll probably always stuck with me because of the modern the modernist nature of her work. You know? mm -hmm. Now, your so parents and your dad, who was a developed this resin for boards and worked in the forestry, but he ended up being an antique dealer later on. Uh, they had, they had a, they had an antique shop in Ohio where they, they, uh, they, they emphasized early American. And then later uh, when we moved to Nola, Wisconsin, they sold a lot of kind of mission style and arts and crafts and stuff like that. And he, he's also an artist. I mean, he decided he would, uh, he would leave his career at the board and chemical company and he was going to move to northern Wisconsin to carve duck decoys, you know, and, and not for use in hunting, but they were, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to carve these, you know, they're basically uh, bird sculptures. Yeah, no, they're, and some are very valuable. Yeah, some of them are. And um, he, excuse me, he, um, he did this for a, about a year and then, uh, and then uh, got a, went up to follow a different career path. But uh you know, I think that some of the, um, he was, he was a, he had some talent as an artist instead of my mother. And so that could have been part of, part of my development too. And did they keep doing the antique business for a while? They did. Yep. They were still participating in shows, even after they had uh, closed that shop, sold the building. They moved to Minneapolis, which is where I was living. 
and they still were in even in their mid 70s they were participating in antique shows yeah that's and interesting. Had interest in that. and then later they actually moved to santa fe for 10 years oh they did yeah yeah so they they had a little place on garcia street and then um for for a couple of years and then sold that and, and moved to uh, was it a shop they actually had a shop on garcia no no uh no they just had a little house there yeah no, by that point, they were kind of really done. I mean, they would still, they always had, a, a, you know, intellectual curiosity in it. And, and they'd go to a different antique shows that like the White Hawk shows and all that stuff. Right. And, and uh, they would find things. I mean, they still continue to collect um, uh, really until, until they moved back to, back to Minnesota, you know. Are they still, so they were, are your folks still alive? Uh, my dad passed away uh, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, my mother is still is still alive. She'll be ninety two this year. Good. I wonder if I ever met him at one of the shows. <laughs> you might have. You might have. They love going to those shows and just, you know, they were they always had a huge interest in collecting, and, and some of that rubbed off on me too. I, yeah, I just when you walk through your house a little bit, moving your computer, I saw the macaw baskets. I saw, you know, I was yeah, yeah. what's on the <laughs> what's in the house. A good well, could, dealer does that. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, here, uh, you, you mind if I walk you through? Yeah, no, go ahead. We're going to, for those who are not watching this on YouTube, you should be, but we're going to yeah. do a little quick walk. And I see yeah. two McCall baskets. I see what sure. looks like a uh, Northwest a, Coast uh, object of some type. Yeah, it's a, it's a model canoe. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then uh, this is, a, this is a, a rug my grandmother bought, actually, in the 1930s. Yeah, and that's and, about right. They actually call that a Delazzo. So Delazzo are these dragonfly people, and this was done really actually about the 1920s time frame. So oh, really? Okay. So it's three figures that look like dragonfly people, and they're used in sand paintings. So, yep. That's, that's more than I ever knew about it. And yeah. then uh, <laughs> you mentioned uh, – you mentioned uh, – uh, John Moyer. Here's one of his. Here's one of his paintings. Right oh yeah. There. So John Moyer. This is a piece that's a blanketed uh, chief in Taos. Yeah. John. I've uh, represented John and Terry for probably close to 20 years. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Were you able to trade that, or do you have to buy it? No. Nope, no. It. It would actually. It actually. Uh, uh, it's. It's actually my my significant other. She and I combined households, and this is a piece that that she had. So she's oh, got. Yeah. She's, she's got, got good got taste. taste. Yeah, she does. And so um, we have a bunch of an eye, an eye dazzler up there. I, yeah, Ganada 1920s. And then we have yes. a bunch of uh, micaceous pots. Uh, yep. 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 So we, we're both collectors. Yeah. Yeah. Both. yeah, we see it. Yeah, no, you definitely are. And your house is clean, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we always try to kind of keep it clean. And then uh, we have some of, I, I don't know, you, you're probably familiar with Jerry Jordan. Jerry Jordan, yep. I love his yep. stuff. He's very yep. good. Yep. We've got a couple of uh, his paintings, and he's been a he's been a close friend of both of ours for a long time. Yeah, and, Jerry's, uh, Jerry's an amazing artist. Actually, yeah, he, he really is, and a terrific person. And uh, okay, let me try to reposition the. Uh, so we've taken see and that's this is why people have to watch it on YouTube too, so they can get to see this extra thing. So if you haven't, if you know, if you always just listen to it, which is fine, but you also get these little intimate moments where you get to see William Haskell's, yeah. you know, life. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when you um, graduate from high school, this is in Wisconsin, right, I assume? Yes. Well, and, I actually, yeah. so uh, after a year in boarding school, I actually returned to the town I lived in Ohio in, and um, I decided I wanted to graduate from the high school down there. And so, uh, so I got an apartment as a senior in high school, and um, and finished my high school education and graduated from, from school down there. Wow. I'm surprised your folks let you do that. <laughs> or did they have no choice? <laughs> There's no choice. I look in your face and no, they had no choice. You said, I'm doing this and that's it. Uh huh. I went to boarding school for them. And then after that, <laughs> <laughs> where was boarding school? Where'd you go? It was uh, Whalen Academy. It was in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Oh yeah. And it probably, you know, it wasn't the right, the right fit for me. My brother went there for three years and loved it. But uh, I, I, I really liked the school I went to in Ohio. And so, uh, so I went back there and. Uh, you must have been the party place as a senior. You have your own place. And, um, yeah, I know. It had to be. It was, it, we, we had some fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> we had 84 minutes for senior lunch. It was uh, yeah. it's amazing what can happen in 84 minutes. So, so you graduate really from high school, and then so you're clearly an independent spirit because if you're willing to do that, you you know you've already decided I'm on my own. I'm going. So where do you go from there? So uh, so then I, I I finally wound up at. Uh, um, I, you know, I was, and I was always painting at this time too. I finally wound up going to the university of Wisconsin stout and it's part of the system, the university of Wisconsin system and it's in Menominee, Wisconsin, and they have a good, uh, graphic design program. So I, by that point I decided, you know what, um, you know, it, growing up in the Midwest, you're not necessarily led to believe that art is a real career. Right. So, so then I decided I would go into graphic design and, and go into illustration and that kind of thing. And I got a degree in graphic design. It was safer. It was, absolutely, absolutely. And in hindsight, um, I don't know if I would have done the same thing or not. Uh, I mean, I, I, I had a terrific time at, at the school and learned a lot about myself and a lot about design and art, but, um, I don't know. I, it, it maybe uh, you know. I look back on that. And I'm like, well, I would have probably been better off just going to Santa Fe in, in 1982 rather than going to college. Mm. Um, it's an interesting thing because I think that that was an amazing time to be in Santa Fe. Artistic. Would have been the best. Yeah, and it's just um, so so that's what I ended up doing. Then I then I moved to uh, to Minneapolis after I graduated from uh, from college and went into. Um, I did some illustration work, went into advertising and design, and and, uh, and then I actually uh, that turned into a job as a sales director, and uh, that's what I did for for um, about fourteen years. And so, what do you do as a sales director? What's involved? Um, you develop. I develop strategic partnerships for the for the company that I worked for, and so I would develop these. Really, they were they were. I'll call them intimate relationships because you, you are very closely connected in, in helping, uh, helping make projects function the way they need to. And we did, uh, we did some really interesting things, especially before the dot-com bubble burst. And we did this rollout for the first Jurassic Park movie where you open this, um, it was basically like a folder. And we developed this, and this was back, you know, in the early 90s, and it had a pop-up, t-rex and then we put a computer chip in it so that it would roar when you'd open it up and it was it was some really cool cutting edge stuff and uh it was a lot of fun and um and uh i really enjoyed it and then uh, a lot of things changed in in 1999 with uh, the dot-com uh bubble uh, people were no longer spending money on things like that were you were you doing a lot of things for dot-com businesses at that time? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. What was the biggest one that you were working with that no longer exists? Pets.com? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, we did, uh, I mean, we would do, um, that, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not, I mean, I don't know if any of them exist, to be honest. I mean, it's, we didn't do any work for like Priceline or anything like that, but we did some really cool stuff. And, and, and we, I mean, we would do uh, annual reports or, or brochures for uh, the, the new Porsche or something like that. And I mean, they were, it was, you know, no expense spared. I mean, it was some really, really uh, interesting projects. So 2000 hit, you get the dot-com bust and, yep. And your, does your job just evaporate or do you go, I need to do something else? No, no, I, but it turned into more um, doing a lot of uh, kind of um, uh, kind of basic work uh, like um, magazine inserts and that kind of thing. You know? Less creative. The creative yeah. juice was gone. Yeah, yeah you, you're, you're creating trash. I mean, you really yeah. are. And, um, and uh, you know, at that point, um, you're right. The creative juice was gone. And then 9-11 happened. And, you know, at that time, that was such an impactful event. You re-examine your life. And, um, and uh, we had been coming out to Santa Fe for, for, you know, close to 10 years and absolutely loved it. And we're just like, you know, it was just like it made absolute sense to say, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. Sold. Uh, I had restored an old Victorian house in Minneapolis and uh, sold it right away. 
and uh, moved to uh, moved to Santa Fe to really start my new life, you know, and that's kind of how that happened. Do you have kids at all? No. Yeah, no. so that makes it a little easier. So you, and what was your wife at that time doing? Um, she was going to do uh, contract work for the state and went to one meeting and decided she didn't want to do it. And then she ended up becoming a real estate broker. Yeah, so, better thing to do, actually. <laughs> it, it is. And, and she, she did extremely well with that, you know. And, and so, and then I, I went, into, uh, went into art. And, uh, and, and actually, as soon as I moved here, I got a call from a, from a friend of mine who I'd gone to college with. And uh, that led to a job, and I, I did an illustration work for a company in Chicago called Learning Curve International, and I illustrated their, their character, uh, Madeline, for about nine months. And so, so when I moved here, I did some illustration work of that kind, and, which isn't the way I paint at all, but it was still a, a kind of nice transitional thing. Um, I would do it for about two weeks a month, and then the rest of the time I would I would be working at developing my body of work. So you had this big epiphany clearly after 9-11 that, that something, this isn't, life is short, I'm guessing, I don't know if this is it, but life is short, I'm making trash, I'm not that happy here, uh, it's right. cold as hell as well in the winter in Minneapolis, yeah. and I need to, it's, I need, I'm running out of, out of runway. Yes. I mean, it was like, it, it was absolute clarity. I mean, it was, uh, and I mean, I remember when it happened. I was in traffic and the traffic there was horrendous. And, um, and I was going to another meeting that I wasn't particularly interested in. And, and I had, you have this, this moment of clarity and you realize if I applied this amount of energy to what I really wanted to do, it would work. And, um, I had this block for a while and I still have it somewhere, but it, it had this quote on that you, you, you it were words to live by. And it's like, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And so that's the question you ask yourself, what would you do? I said, would I produce trash? I'm like, nope, I would go <laughs> and pursue my art. I would do what I absolutely want to do. So that was the, that was the moment. That's a big, and how long between that epiphany until you go to Santa Fe? Um, probably about six months. And, uh, you know, I had to wrap things up. I had to, uh, uh, you know, sold a house. I still, um, had, I didn't have like a, a hardcore contract with my employer, but it, it served me well to stay for a while and help in that transition. Yeah. Um, because I, it, it, it I basically got a nice bonus out of it, you know, and, yeah. and, and I had been careful, saved money and, um, kind of in preparation for this. And so it, but it took about six months before, uh, you know, before I actually got to Santa Fe. Mm, yeah, and at that point, you know, we had uh, come out to, uh, to Indian market in, um, in 2001. And, you know, we were both kind of at this point where we were thinking, okay, um, we love New Mexico, love Santa Fe. In five years, we're going to live here. Mm -hmm. And, by the time I got back, I went to a, a, an award ceremony in Chicago that wrapped up on September 10th. And we flew back to Minneapolis. And um, I had developed this brochure and it had uh, received a couple of these Benny Awards, which is kind of like an Oscar. In, yep, in I know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so it, it won two of them. And so it was a big, uh, you know, kind of a nice high point for me to get out. And it was, uh, it was for the company I worked for and in conjunction with Georgia Pacific. They were the paper uh, provider and it was a huge design project. And so, um, and of course the next day was September 11th. And, and I was, and it was, it was a, just a pivotal moment. I mean, you can kind of, now you hear about 9-11 and, and it almost seems like another day, but at that time it was, it was so impactful and uh, really made you think. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're in that same moment now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people are changing lifestyles and the way they do things that yes. are going to change their life, the geography of how cities are lived in and thought of and work and all that stuff. You know, yep. we may not recognize it, but this is a very long day, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah, right. long yeah. it's a very long day, and it's yeah. definitely going to do the same thing. So, um, and hopefully, maybe some artists out there are going, yeah, 
maybe I need to re tap into my roots. So you do that in 2011, you're out of here, you get there by 2000, I mean, 2001, you get there to Santa Fe by 2002. Yes. Yep. April. And, yep. And so you're going to be an artist. I'm going to follow my dream. And so how did that work out for? for well, you know, I got here and I realized that I probably not as not prepared as carefully as I should have. Um, you know, and then I started to really look around and, and just, I took a minute uh, or, or a few weeks and, and really stepped back and examined, you know, the art market part of it, you know, and, and, um, cause I knew, you know, I had, uh, I, you know, I had, I had painted since I was a kid and I had spent a lot of time drawing. So it's not that I didn't have talent or have skill, but it was definitely, I look back and I would say it was undeveloped. Mm. And so, but I started to really look around and think, you know what, um, to have your own recognizable style is a critical element in this. And so then I just, you know, started to really work on developing that. And, um, I got a show at, I, I, I became a guest artist at, at Manitou. Um, and then I got a show there and I developed, um, I did 24 paintings. They're all watercolor kind of small dry brush watercolor paintings and um and it did well you know i sold probably sold 16 of them that that month that the show opened and uh they picked me up as a full-time artist i bet they did <laughs> yeah, no, and, and honestly Dane, they are going to pick you up as a full-time artist right and so you know from that point on it was um it really um uh you know i really worked at developing my technique with dry brush watercolor and I had worked in oil, I had worked in egg tempera and that kind of thing. And so I, I did, I wanted to create these paintings that were not like any other watercolor painting. So I used a much heavier application and it was, um, at first they started off as being fairly, you know, kind of strict, strictly realistic. And then the more I worked at them, the more I, I, um, they became a, more of a modernist interpretation. And, um, then in 2012, I was, um, I was offered a residency at this ranch in, um, and, and actually, actually, let me backtrack. So, so I'm doing these paintings, you know, it was, you know, I picked up, um, you know, five or six other galleries and really it was, um, it was going great until the recession hit and, and it wasn't so much Santa Fe, but it was all the other markets that I, that I was in were so badly impacted by the recession that, I mean, a lot of the other galleries just simply closed. And so it almost uh, kind of put me back to being just in Santa Fe. And, um, and which worked out okay. Um, you know, Manitou was selling pretty much everything I painted and, and it, was, it was okay. And, um, but as I continued to develop my dry brush watercolors, I kind of took it as far as I could, you know, with, with that particular medium. You know, it just the, the chemistry of the paint, you can only take it so far before it, and things become a mess. And um, so I was offered this, this residency at this place called Brush Creek Ranch, which is in, um, in uh, um, Wyoming, in, in Saratoga, Wyoming. And it was for a month. And I went there and decided that I would leave all my, um, all my watercolors and take only these acrylic paints that I had purchased with the intention of, of developing um, acrylic paintings, but I had never really done it because I would start for a day and it would be like, well, I would always kind of go back to what I knew. And so, um, so, but I thought this is the perfect opportunity for me just to simply go and try something completely different. And, um, and that's what I did. So by the end of the end of the month, I had developed six paintings that uh, were of a, you know, of a, of a new style that I wanted to really work with. And, um, I brought him back to the, uh, uh, I brought him back and actually it was interesting. My, my ex-wife looked at him and she was like, she was like, what are you gonna do with him? I said, well, I'm going to take him to the gallery tomorrow. I mean, I want, I mean, so far the reaction I got to him was extremely favorable. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going to take him to the gallery, see what happens. And she's like, you're crazy, you know? And, uh, and so, um, so we had a little disconnect there, but um, uh, just a, a blip. And then um, I took him to Manitou, and and they loved him, and and all of them sold, you know, within the within a couple of weeks. And um, and it had this 
And it had a, a certain amount of energy to it that my, my work that I had been doing up until that point didn't seem to have. And so I felt like, you know, it was enough to make me say, you know what, this is really the direction I need to pursue. And this is, and some of it was just fear. Um, and I worked so much as a realist that I was always, and a lot of it was from, you know, photography and that kind of thing. And so for the first time, I'm like, I need to stop working from photographs. I need to work really from my imagination. And so there's this, this uh, real uh, disconnect that has to happen where you're, you're no longer making that comparison. You're no longer, am I, do I look realistic? Am I, am I hitting it? And, um, and you, and I had to just separate from that and kind of focus more on creating my own world, so to speak, you know, based on past experiences, based on places I've been, based on more of the emotional sense I felt in those places, rather than trying to duplicate uh, the, 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 the appearance of those places on a piece of paper or a panel. And so that became really the main focus of my work. And so when you made this jump, so you get this, you get the opportunity because it's a month re uh, residency, yep. but there must have been something going up to that point for you to go, I've got to try something else. And was that something else because you just had gone as far as you could as an artist with the watercolors or was it, you really wanted to do, do something completely different because you know they sell, you know right. the watercolors sell, you, and people are starting to recognize you've been doing that now for 10 years. You've been painting and, and successful. Yep. Now you make this massive change, really. Right. What was that? I mean, why? It was, it was honestly, it was probably, it was a little bit of both. It was the fact that I had taken the, the watercolor as far as I could. I mean, it really, it got to the point where, and I knew I wanted to do other things with it, you know, and, and then it was just, I was always, you know, and I had almost my secret paintings that, and these, these drawings that I've been developing that were just purely modernist, my modernist vision of what I wanted to do. But there was, and like I said, it's all, it's all just, it's all fear. I mean, because I was making a living and I was selling, you know, the, the dry brush paintings, they were popular paintings. And, um, and so to, to almost, um, you know, completely break away from that and try something totally different. It's all, it's almost like you're starting over again, but I thought, you know what, I've almost taken this, the, the dry brush paintings as far as I can. And I felt like my next step to really do what I wanted to do was to just leave it behind and do something truly follow what I want to do. And, um, and that was not sit and, and kind of labor over a lot of uh, details based in realism. And, um, and I respect real, realistic painting. I did it for years and it's, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of skill and effort. And, um, but I had just gotten to the point where that just wasn't, the focus of my work anymore. Do you think working in a different media of acrylic versus watercolor also lent to the ability to break free? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was almost like a kind of a tipping point. Cause your palette yes. has changed mm -hmm. too dramatically, right? Oh, well, it did. I mean, you can get a much stronger color range out of, out of, I mean, you know, I mean, watercolors are, are, it's, they're, they're beautiful paintings. I mean, they're, and I, and I, I had been able to take it, where I could carefully layer the, the paint and develop a really strong palette, but it just was never quite, um, it was never quite enough. You know, there was always something that I wanted to try to do with it, but I couldn't because of the chemistry of the paint it just wouldn't allow for it. I mean, things, you know, I would take it to this point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to try one more, one more layer of paint. And inevitably it was one too many. And then I would spend the next three days trying to fix it. Mm. So what was it like when you did that first one, that first painting with acrylics that I assume must have had kind of the style you have now? Did you? It, it, yeah. it, it, it was, uh, I mean, to me, it was, it was a tremendously exhilarating, uh, freeing event. And for the first time I was, you know, I was, you know, I draw a thing on the sketchbook beforehand. And so I was drawing these, um, you know, and I was isolated in kind of a place where I was just left to my own devices. And, and I was, I was drawing, 
um, you know, these preliminary studies for, for other paintings. And it was a, a very freeing event. I mean, it really was. And it was a very creative thing too. And, and, you know, I would sit and ask myself, I'm like, well, you know, I draw it out. I'm like, well, why can't I paint this? I mean, cause I would be like, well, you know, you, you can kind of get stuck in, on these, on these uh, nuances of, well, it needs to look like this particular landscape or this particular mountain range. And it's like, then I was like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have to look like anything. It's like, there's nobody telling me, it, 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 trying to determine what one mountain range looks like from another. And so it's almost like this, this mind game that you have to simply get over. And once I did that, then I was like, you can just do things that are much more creative, I think. Well, your paintings have a real strong emotional uh, sensibility to them. You know, and I mean, there's a lot of turbulence in my, and this is how I see them. Well, it's true story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and um, chaos to some extent, yet there's a, there's some kind of a story there that you can see in these, you know, there's something, you know, I relate to them from a standpoint of where I grew up in New Mexico with abandoned homes and that sensibility of something that was there and now is maybe gone. And what was that life? And um, that, you know, and to me, art's, this is what all, art is all about, right? It has to have some kind of emotional draw, whether it's a positive, a negative, you know, something, when you look at it, you need to go, uh, uh and you found that for sure in your work. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I agree. I mean, you know, you know, when I, uh, uh, part of what I loved about New Mexico um, is, you know, you drive down these roads and you see like an old homestead and it's abandoned and it's like, you know, you know, at one time it wasn't, and and there was uh, there was um, life and energy there, and there was all kinds of things happening there, and and it that that has always fascinated me, um, uh, kind of what's left behind, and whether I'm so whether I'm here or whether uh, um, whether I'm in the Midwest or wherever, you can come across places like that, and you can almost feel the presence of them, you know, and, yeah. and to me that is fascinating, and. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, when I used to paint uh, my more realistic paintings, I would listen to a lot of books, uh, a lot of audio books, because to me, um, realism is like literature. You know, you're, you're definitely, you're telling a story with that. And, um, and, I, and there were times where I would try to, try to pair um, a particular book. Uh, I'd choose a book based on the painting I wanted to do mm -hmm. to put me in this mindset of telling the story. And I still believe that, that a good painting tells, you know, it tells a good story. It just, I think it's really helpful. I mean, and that's why I'll put uh, certain narratives in my work that help perpetuate that. And now, um, so I always looked at as realism as, as like literature and then as modern art, it's like music. And, and especially when you, you think about uh, like a Jackson Pollock painting, it's like jazz, it's completely, it's just, utter chaos you know it's yeah, exactly. unstructured it's just yeah it's just and so <clears throat> you know i i obviously i'm i'm not painting like jackson pollock but i think there's an in between there where uh you can do a little bit of both and so that's where um that's really what i what i wanted to capture with my work you know and 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 also i think that to capture the emotional presence um makes all the difference in the world. I, you know, I've always loved, you know, Andrew Wyeth's work and the mood and the emotion that was in that work was the, the strongest part, part of it, you know? And, and he had said, um, I was reading, you know, I've read a few books on his work and, and he was like, uh, said something like, uh, I'm not quoting here, but it was like, you know, he knows 10 other artists with a surer hand than himself, like that are better realists, but what his work has is that mood. And that's so true. It has this, and it, to me, it was always a little bit of darkness, but I, I liked that, you know, I, I, and I always thought, found that fascinating, you know, that he could interject that in there and you'd know it. Yeah. The isolationism yeah. that he sees and the, the lone woman looking over uh, longingly, you know, who right. know the story, you know, and the backstory really is she had, I think, polio and it was hard for her to get around. Yeah. Yep. 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 She dragged herself around. Uh, yeah. Christine. Yep. Yeah. Christine. Yeah. And, and so, so to me, it's like, I think, 
you know, being able to put that emotional content into a painting is, is one of the most important parts of it because then you can really, you, you create that kind of unknown, that, that intrinsic value of it, you know? And these paintings, I assume must take a lot of effort time-wise. They, they look like it just, you know, I haven't watched you paint yet, but I do plan on doing that at some point. Yeah. Um, but it, they look like they, there's a time uh, suck there to make these things. Uh, there is definitely um, even even from you know I'll take a couple of days um, before I start a, a cycle of work and some of that is determined maybe I'll have a few different shows coming up and I'm like okay I'm gonna I need to get in this headspace of like okay I'm gonna design uh, a dozen paintings so I'll take a couple of days and just just design paintings and and I try to do that so that I, I'm not constantly repeating myself because when you work from your head that's the tendency you have is to, to repeat yourself so I want to make sure that I'm always introducing new subjects and, and new uh, compositions and that kind of thing so then I'll start to uh, you know lay the paintings out and I'll go through so I'll draw it out in just a small sketchbook and then I'll draw out the painting full size excuse me and um, you know so I can kind of double check myself double check my perspective and my foreshortening and because there is an element of realism still in my work. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll draw it out full size in a panel and I'll usually draw, you know, five or six paintings. And like right now I, I'm working on three different ones. And then, then I will kind of choose the one I feel um, connecting with energetically the most like the cactus painting I just finished for you. That's something I drew out, you know, a couple of months ago. And I'm like, is there enough of a narrative here? And um, I love that painting, by the way. Thank you so much. And, and, you know, it was like, and actually, you know, the, um, um, the, uh, the, my significant other or Angela, she really, she really said, this is the painting you need to do um, first. And, um, and, you know, sometimes I can, I can, I want to put a, a very obvious narrative in there and that one really didn't have one, but it was just about, you know, I love the shapes of the desert, especially in Arizona, the, that, that uh, geometric um, shapes of the landscape that you see just naturally occurring. And then, and I love cactus and kind of getting all the different plant life in there that, uh, that I'm so drawn to in that, in that part of the country and just having it about that, you know, and just, um, so, so I'll pick a painting like that and just gradually start to, to paint from my furthest distance, which is the sky, to my, to my foreground, uh, which is just the way I've always painted. And I paint them flat. And, um, and there'll be 40 or 50 layers of paint on that. I mean, there's a noticeable weight difference in the panel when I'm done with it. Mm. And even though you don't see a tremendous amount of texture in there, you know, there's all the subliminal layers of paint. I can see it. I can see yeah. it. Yeah. And that's really, and that's really what, and so that is like, um, you know, I've tried to do them quicker and, and to develop, you know, a faster style, but it just never really works. It's like, you know, it, every painting is a self portrait. So you, you, uh, no matter what you're doing. And so that is just simply the way I paint, you know, it's just, you're just designed to do that one thing. And so, you know, they just end up taking as long as they take. And that one, I probably spent, you know, about 10 days on it. And, mm. and I could, I could have probably done it in six days if I would have just worked, you know, 10 or 12 hour days on. And uh, just depending on what, you know, I feel energetically, but that one ended up taking about 10 days. Yeah. And that, that explains why you don't want to do big ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. And that one is actually, yeah, it's a 24 by 18. So it's kind of one of my medium ones, but I'll do larger paintings. But yeah, if I do a 30 by 40, you know, I'll spend, I could spend five weeks on it. And, um, and, uh, and I need to do larger paintings. I, I really do. And usually when I'll do a larger painting like that, I'll, I'll maybe take a couple of days away from it and just work on a smaller painting. It's funny. I would, I'm always a fan of getting the biggest work of an artist. And I'll tell you why. Because when I get to sell a major work, I know the effort that went into it. And I yeah. know that there's only so many of these in your life that you're going to be able to do, right? There's just a limited amount that you can actually do in a life. And I get that sense when I have one of these major paintings 
that this is one of the great ones of this artist that he ever did or she did. And uh, it gives me a thrill, quite frankly, to be able to be the person that gets to place that painting. So feel free to give me the big ones. I'm happy to have them. Uh, You know, I will. Just based on that statement, because so many, so many people in the art business, I shouldn't say so many, some people are like, it's just simply, we just need another sale for today. And it's like, that is not how an artist wants their work to be treated. I mean, because every one of them, I mean, I put, I give it 100%. You know, I'm working on a nine by 12 right now, but it's gonna, I'm gonna give it everything I have. And so when you, and I, and I try to make each one better than the last. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, this isn't the masterpiece yet. You know, and, and so, and you have to do that. Otherwise you become complacent and you're just gonna kind of churn out kind of the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And that is not what I want to see happen. I mean, that's not where, where I'm going to take my art. Yeah. And, and that's the struggle. You know, I was, I was having dinner, this was a couple of years ago, but I was having dinner with, uh, with some collectors and, and uh, he's a financial guy uh, from Texas. And, and he's like, so how many paintings do you pay in a year? And, and, um, and I told him, he's like, he's like, you know, that's a problem because you, you, you have a cap to your income. And I was like, well, it's not necessarily, I said, you're right, but it's, you know, you know, I didn't get into the whole theory of basing that, you know, my prices will continue to increase. And, and, but I had to explain to them that, you know, it's not always about how much money you're going to make. And although that is a factor, you, you know, you gotta, I gotta sell one to paint the next one. But the most important thing is, is creating something that I think is really exceptional. And that's the most important thing. So when you talk about, you know, you want to sell the monumental ones because you know what went into it, that's, there's not a lot of people that look at it that way. You know? Oh, so, man, I do. I get chills when I see one of those. Yeah. Literally get chills. I know how much time and effort, and yeah. this is like one of just a few that they may get to do in their lifetime. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and to me, that, that's like an honor to be able to handle one of those pieces. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So give me the big ones. I'm happy. I'm, I'll take every one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we'll do that. And, and it's like, it's so good to hear that because it's got to be more than just about making a, making a buck. Oh yeah. Really don't. Well, I wouldn't be doing this if it was just for money. I, you know, I could have done a lot of other things. I could have stayed in medicine if I wanted to. Yeah. There's gotta yeah. be more about, you know, and I think all artists are pretty within most artists. I won't say all, but most artists, I think they know that this is not how they get rich. You know, they do this. They can, just like you said, I can only do what I can do. You're right. It's time limited, but this is, you know, this is my, what I do and I'm going to make as many as I can make. And, you know, but I want them all to be good, you know, and the great artists do that. They always make them each one. They want to be great, whether it's a little 10, 14 or a 10 feet by 14, they want it to be something that is resonates forever, hopefully. Right. You know, and, and I, I, I absolutely agree. And, and, a small painting can still have a big presence. I mean, Oh, absolutely. If, you think about, and so Salvador Dali was, uh, when I was a kid, I, I, he was a huge influence of mine. And the persistence of memory is a tiny painting, but it's like when you see it, it you, it's a huge, it has a huge presence to it, you know? So it doesn't have to be something gigantic. You just no. want it to be great. I've got one right now that's 10 by 14 that I bought, or maybe not even that. That's a uh, Armin Hansen. That's just a little, you know, this kind of piece, size piece of cowboys in 1930, you know, throwing up dust and everything. And it's one of my favorite paintings in my whole collection. It just, you can, uh, you can sense the, the, the dust and the, the clinic activity, you know, and it's 1930, right? So you know, rodeos haven't even been around that long, you know, maybe 45 years. So it was, you know, to me that has history and it has action. And it's also a painting that is um, abstract in a sense. I mean, it's an impressionistic painting. So, and I love it. So I look at it every day. So little paintings can have huge impact for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been doing this now for, uh, since 2012 in this t- style, which I will say this is your style. I would, uh, you know, who knows? You may have another epiphany and you may change, but it seems to me that this is where your career is going to con- continue to go is in this, um, I don't even know how you want to describe it, uh, 
modern, um, you know, because there is a realism to it. It's modern realism almost. Right, right, yes. Yeah, and, and so, so, yeah, this is where, and I've done completely modern paintings. And, I'm um, sure, I could see that. Yeah, and, and it's just like, that's how you learn. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you try try to learn something from every painting that I do, you know, and, and um, but I do see, you know, my career continuing with this style of painting. And, and, um, and there are some times where I make them difficult for a reason. And it's so that they always remain my own. And it's, it's because if they're technically difficult and, and, you know, I don't want them to, um, I don't want it to be, look like hard labor, but at the same time, I want them to be exclusive and to remain my own. And that's, where you just make them technically very difficult and you do a lot of extra steps that gives them a certain, a certain element that they wouldn't have otherwise. And they'll just remain on their own that, that way. Yeah. And that's, that's part of what I, why I do what I do. Well, it's been interesting for me. They've been very easy to sell. Um, and you don't know, right? I have no idea. It's a new artist. I don't know. I like it. My wife yeah. likes it, but I don't know. Uh, you know, how it resonates. And um, clearly we found a market kind of right off the bat for your work. No, I know. it. I, I, and, and it's been, I mean, it, especially even through the virus, it's been like absolutely fantastic. And so I appreciate it so much. You know, it really is nice. Yeah, no. And usually with an artist, it takes a while to develop, you know, and, and I think this is a good thing for artists that are out there to get a gallery you know, just because you don't maybe sell right off the bat, sometimes it takes, and usually it takes a while to develop the, the base, the client base for those. And then it just hopefully kind of goes up and, and, and never stops. And it gets easier and easier. Like Ed Mel, it's very easy. I mean, I've been selling his work sure. 25 years. You know, he's great anyway, but you know, you still have, to, you still have to develop the client base. And uh, so it's interesting how, I think you you have this built-in client base already, not just from, you know, it's clearly there. There's an appetite for what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I would definitely stay on this style. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I intend, and you know, some of it is, is uh, I'll look at, you know, the, the, the people who collect my work and the people who are drawn to it. And I'm always happy when, you know, somebody who's 80 years old buys one of my paintings. I'm like, that's a great thing, you know, and, and cause they, a lot of them tend to buy things that are much more traditional. But what I really like is when I see somebody who's in their mid thirties, they're buying one. Mm -hmm. And um, cause just what I've noticed just from spending time observing, you know, the art world and artists is that as an, uh, most artists, they tend to sell their work to people who are right around their same age. And when you get a broad age spectrum that gives you longevity in your career. And so I always want to see young people, you know, those younger uh, millennial generations, that kind of thing, drawn to my work, um, even if they can't afford it right away. Mm -hmm. Because I think that um, it usually means you're ahead of your time. And, and I think that that's a really important thing for, for an artist to, to experiment and try new and different things. And, and you know, I, I, there's times where I, where I don't like to get rejected, but it's it's part of business and it's part of part of life. And, and I just look at it as like, those people just are not ready yet. You yeah. know, and that's, that's part of it, you know? And, and if you're, so, you know, I think that the best years of my career are still yet to come. Oh yeah, I agree. And I think you're right about the rejection. I mean, when you reached out to me, you know, you don't know, maybe I'll reject you. And that's, that's a really hard thing to take, especially if you're a good artist, you know, you're a good artist, you're selling a lot of artwork, you're unique, you have your own style. And then somebody goes, Nope, sorry, doesn't fit for me. And that's right. got to be very disheartening, you know, as an artist to go, God, you know, really? Yeah. You know? Well, and, 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 you know, I apply to, to a lot of shows and uh, I get into a lot of them and, uh, but a lot of them still, still say no. And, uh, and that's just part of it, you know, and that just makes it that much better when you actually do get it. And, but some of them, honestly, I look at it as like, you know what, you're just not ready yet. Yeah. I said, you will be in, in, a, in, in the, in some years to come, you will be because that is the direction that the art world is heading in, I believe, you know, and, 
and some of the some of the shows are still very much uh, enthralled in, in in a very traditional style of painting. But I think it would serve them well to to open it up to a broader range of things. But for whatever reason, they're not ready yet, and that's just the way it is, and that's okay, you know. And and um, but I think that I, I like to see you know shows that are embracing not only great traditional work, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and um, and I see a lot of it that I'm like, that is a terrific painting, you know, no matter what style it's painted in or who did it or what the medium is, you can still see uh, terrific work in, in every style out there. And I'll see modern things that are being done by someone who's in their twenties. I'm like, you killed it on that painting, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's a, I, I think that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. I'm always looking for that next generation of artists. Yeah. So we have one, kid josh gibson who's 28 you yeah know? <laughs> and he's qualified to be in this gallery absolutely and he's and looking at the world a little differently he sees the western art a little differently way differently actually and yeah. um, but he's got an original voice and you know he's still trying to hone it in like all all artists probably are to some extent but you know as a gallerist it's no different than what you just said it's important that i have a variety of artists too not an age group. You know, my age group is 28 to 98. That's, how, that's the ages of that's, my office. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic, you know, because you, it just gives you, I, it, like I said, I think it gives you longevity. I mean, it really, it really does. And, and it's uh, fun. It is. It is. It makes it, <laughs> yeah, it makes it more fun rather than, just being stuck. And I mean, you know, for me, the, uh, when people ask me about my work and they're like, you know, what, what really, what, are, what inspires you artistically or who my influences are? It's not necessarily, and I have, I have many, but it's, it's really a, a time period. It's the first 50 years of the 20th century, really, mm. really that I feel are the, is the biggest influence in my work. And it's not so much of an artist. It's more of an artistic movement. Yeah, I like, see it. Benton. Yeah. yeah. Dixon. Like, yeah. like modernism and, and regionalism and surrealism and, and things like that. I mean, I can name 30 artists that I, I love their work. I, I think that they were brilliant artists and, and did all had something uniquely different about their work, but it's not any like one particular artist. You know? Yeah. So I'm going to give you a place to go find some great old houses. So where I grew up in Eastern New Mexico, it was a place called Portales. So just take a trip from Santa Fe in about three hours, go to Elida, Floyd, Dora, House, you know, Grady, Portales, okay. all those places, especially in Elida, I think you'll just see, you know, homestead after homestead where the elm trees are barely alive or dead. The houses are yep. in disrepair. Um, but boy, you can see the life of the you know, the farmer and the rancher at that time. And it's gotten very difficult for those people and they've moved okay. on. But yeah, that, 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 that's a place you got to take a trip and bring your camera and get some reference material. Yep. I'll check that out. I know that I think, I think it's Portales. Their library has a good mural there too. Yeah, no. And I don't know. I know yeah, the I, hospital I, I, has, has a good mural, right. has some good, uh, they have some Peter Hurds actually. Oh, uh, you know what? That's the, that I was trying to like, cause I saw an article in the New Mexico magazine about it. And I want to say it's the Portales library and they have a terrific Peter Hurd mural. In it. And so, uh, so, so I've always meant to go down there and check it out. Yeah. Our hospital does for sure. Cause I even did an uh, externship there, you know, a zillion years ago. And I remember going okay. to the patient room and I was enthralled <laughs> with the, with the paintings on the, on the wall, the Hurd paintings. They were so fantastic. They were original, you know, right. <laughs> just, you know, on, and they, I remember those aspects. Yeah, those kind of things are important. Growing up as a kid, the Tower uh, Theater had these huge murals that were WPA murals. That yeah. Were, well, I don't know how big they were, but I remember looking at those as a kid, watching, you know, waiting for the movie to begin or end and just being in awe of those murals and spending, yep. you know, so many times looking at them. And I'm sure those influenced me and I didn't know it at the time, but they definitely did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I look at like the library, or, or excuse me, the post office in downtown Santa Fe has got some terrific murals. And then uh, when I go to Denver, uh, I'll go to the Brown Palace and, and places like that. And you see these, these epic murals and the sense of simplicity and design behind them 
are just, it's just amazing work. I mean, it really is. So put, take your hands and put them up. I want everybody to see what your hands look like. See that? That's a real artist. He's got purple, bluey sky stuff on his hands. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, was, I just started to kind of work on a painting this morning, or I'm finishing one particular part of it. And so, uh, so I paint everything. I use kind of a cerulean blue underpainting, so I create my shadows first and everything. Yeah, that's all. So I paint everything blue first, and then I do an overpaint with, uh, with burnt sienna. And we'll also put up this cactus painting that we're talking about that's coming our way on the video. So again, I encourage okay. people to go to YouTube to watch this, you know, just if nothing else to see that image and, uh, and William's blue hands, but <laughs> anything right. else you want to uh, share with our audience before we let you get back to work? No, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate the, 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 time and the uh the energy that you've given uh my work that i sent down there and i'll definitely send some uh some large paintings down to you oh yeah i'm excited about that i am too we'll have a party the day one of those shows up okay (laughs) we really will sounds sounds good (laughs) well thank you so much i I appreciate it you're a fantastic artist we're thrilled that we've gotten to have you in our in our gallery and i would have had you on whether you're in my gallery or not you're one of those unique individuals and you know that's part of what this whole art dealer diaries podcast is is to find those unique voices that are out there whether they're you know my gallery or somebody else's i don't really care you know but i want to hear those stories and you definitely have an interesting story well thank you so much and it's an honor to be in your gallery and uh, thank you for the representation. And I will be seeing you at Las Campanas sometime in the future, I'm sure, uh, when we are allowed to go do those things. I'm hoping next summer. You know, I'm, I'm, I do a show every year there, so except this year. So, Sounds fantastic. Well, yeah. when you're in town again, we, we would love to have you have you up to our home and and uh, and uh, spend some spend some uh, some time with you. So, yeah, I would love to see the studio too, because you know, I t- I think it's really important for art dealers to watch artists paint, especially their artists, because you get a whole different sensibility of how things are laid down and what's involved and what's going on versus just looking at, or, you know, again, it's the whole, it's it's the holistic part of being an art dealer that you understand the process. I can't be a physician just without knowing, understanding the process of the body and all the things that go with it. I don't think you can be an art dealer either, unless you kind of understand how things are done technically. I don't think you can be a great one. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that that's, I think it's very helpful and to want to spend that time is important. You know? Yeah. Yeah, No, it's, I like doing that. I can't, I'm not a painter. I'm not ever going to be a a painter. I do. You're a writer. So I write and I do my, you understand, you understand the artistic process for that. Boy, I do on that one. Yeah. And I think the number one thing in that is consistency. Just yeah. get after yep. it every day. You know, even yep. when you don't want to do it, you got to do it. Yep. yep. It's like, it's really like going to a job, you know, and it's yeah. like, you know, whenever I run into these artists, they're like, well, how do you, um, I'm waiting to be inspired. I'm like, <laughs> how do you get inspired? I'm like, it happens right around eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's just when the coffee like you, hits. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's like you do it uh, on a good day or a bad day or uh, just uh, any day. I mean, you, you, you've got to be consistent. Yeah, consistency is everything. And anybody who's waiting to be inspired, you're in mm-hmm. trouble. You know, yeah. you might want to rethink what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. And we will... <laughs> See you soon, and I'm looking forward. When's that painting coming my way, by the way? Uh, you know, I, I have it right here, uh, and so I'm going to sign it, and then it's going go to go uh, to my photographer with another one tomorrow, and then you'll see it uh, probably at the beginning of next week. I've got a frame for it and everything, so it should be beginning of next week. That's fantastic. I really like that painting a lot. That Thank one, you. Know, it just resonated right off the crack. It was like, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do. I, yeah. So far, I've gotten, I've showed it to a couple of other people. The reaction has gotten has been very favorable. So um, yeah, 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 it's a good one. Yeah, it's really I'm good. excited to send it to you. All, All right. Yeah. All right. We'll talk soon, and I, I look forward to getting the painting. Thank you, Mark. Go Thanks ahead. so much. Thank you right. so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.